Heavenly like, Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this Sunday, and thank you for what a special day it is that is Mother's Day. And we celebrate mothers, a great blessing that's given to us, and we pray that you please lead us and guide us in this worship service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. And I want to say happy Mother's Day if it applies to you. We're glad to have you here today. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, the ad board has um, been changed to the uh, uh, Tuesday, so it'll be the 21st. And all are invited to that open ad board meeting. Um, Hannah's house is our mission of the quarter, and that will be next month, I believe. Um, I don't think I have anything else, um, but Miss Ruth has something for us. Good morning. Good morning. Try again. Good morning. Good morning. That's much better. Happy Mother's Day. And that doesn't just go out to biological mothers. That goes out to every woman who's ever wanted to be a mother and didn't get to. That goes out to every father who's had to step up and be a mother for whatever reason. That goes out to every woman of Christian faith who has tried to lead, guide, and direct a child towards God and towards salvation. And it does go out to those biological mothers. And mine isn't with me today, but my, uh, my second mother is, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I have a mother-in-law who I can call a second mother. Um, I'm telling you, that story of Ruth and Naomi in the Bible has nothing on us. <laughs> I have a very, very quick reading, and then I'd like to recognize each mom. It's the Christian Mother's Creed. It could also be the Christian woman's creed if you wanted to read it that way. I am a Christian mother. I seek God first in the morning. I serve the living God and walk in love. I will train my children in the ways of the Lord. I will not kick and wound my children with my words. I will equip myself with God's word and walk in in wisdom. I will not live in hypocrisy, and I will not gossip in my house. I will be vigilant, prayerful, and I will not be ignorant of the enemy's schemes. I will never quit on my children's salvation. I will ever be on my knees praying for them. I am a warrior in alliance with God to raise godly children. They are the arrows in my hand. I am a guardian of biblical truths and the Christian way of life. I am a Christian mother. My children call me blessed. And again, like I said, that could go out to not just biological mothers, but to every single Christian woman who has ever had a hand. I was talking to Pastor out in the, uh, the, the narthex. And the, yes, did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> I was talking to Pastor out there about all the Christian women who have been examples in my life, my own mother being one of them, my mother-in-law, multiple women from this church, Annie Mitchell specifically, came to my mind. Um, Sister Jewel Keith, who was my Sunday school teacher when I was a little girl, um, first getting started in faith. Uh, so to every godly Christian woman and mother, we say thank you. I would like to recognize each and every mother in church today. I'm going to call out a few special mothers. Um, and then from there, if I've missed any special category, I'd like each mother to please come forward. So we'll start with any mother who has lost a child. I'd like to ask any mother in the congregation today who has lost a child to please come forward first. That is a pain and a grief that I am so eternally grateful I have not had to bear. 
if each of you would please choose a rose and a candy in the middle. Get off of here so I can move a little bit. <laughs> I want you all to stay up here. So don't go back and sit down. Miss Diane, you have a very pretty shirt on. <laughs> Let's see. Who is the mother here today with the most children present? Elena came in with three. I believe our pastor's wife, Miss Kristen, has all four of hers with her today. <laughs> what was that? Winner, winner, chicken dinner. No, winner, winner, rose and candy. <laughs> Let's ask for the mother here with the youngest child with them today. I believe that would be Miss Elena. <laughs> we can fill up the whole stage. It's okay. That's a good thing. See, if you folks in Facebook land were here with us today, you could come up on stage and help us fill it up. We do wish you all a happy Mother's Day, though. Can I have the mom with the oldest child who's here with them today? And I, I'm pretty sure I know who this one is. The mother here who has the oldest child with them today. I'm pretty <laughs> sure my husband made her that mom. <laughs> Choose a rose and a candy. How about any mothers here today who have only one child? Mothers who are mothers to only children. I think we've got a couple of those. Don't forget a candy. You can take it to your grandkids. The well, I'm pretty sure there's going to be extras, Nana. Pick one right now, and we'll see what's left. <laughs> Any mothers who aren't up on stage right now who are mothers to service men or women? Any mother who has a child who has served in the military? Let's see. Hmm. Who's my oldest mom here today? Not the mom with the oldest child, but who's my oldest mother here today? Sure, is it you, Shirley? Who is my youngest mother who is here today? Is my youngest mother already up here? Elena, how old are you? What year is it? <laughs> it's 2024, Elena. I think, I think I still no, I, I don't know how old I am. Oh. <laughs> okay, all right. What year were you born, Amber? Okay. She's got you beat, but you're next. And 
So we'll have you come up. <laughs> Let's see. Who is my mother who was the last person to get to church today? <laughs> it's okay. It still counts. You are here, and that's all that matters. You can blame it on your kids. <laughs> and, and, and you just got beat out anyway. Because now we have a later arrival. So can I have my latest arrival, uh, who is a mother, please come up. <laughs> All right, I, I see two other ladies out there. I'm not sure. I know one of them is. Miss Shirley, do you have kids? Two kids. Miss Shirley, can you come up? Look at this group of godly Christian warriors. We got, we got a few more coming. Hang on. Hold the applause. So I see a mother out there who didn't fit into a box. She didn't fit into any single one of my categories that I called out. That makes her the most special mother of all. Ms. Norma Jean, would you come up? Moms don't fit in boxes. We're jacks of all trades and masters of every single one of them. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. She was a rose and a candy. There's still candy in that bowl? Okay. All right. I do still have, I have some refills, so <laughs> just making sure. All right, Miss Vicki, step back in here with the group. Mr. Roy, can you get a picture of this Motley crew? All right. Hang on. Hang on. You got to stand up in the middle. Let's see. Short women in the front. Mother's Day, ladies. May you be blessed. I did. I'm a military mom. All right. Good morning. If you will stand and join with me as we start to worship the Lord together. Bring your burdens. Bring your pain. Bring your worries, your hurting, bring your shame. We don't need them anymore. We are standing 
in the presence of the Lord. God is in this house. God is in this house. That's all that matters now. That's all that matters now. Be forgiven. Be restored. Find your healing. All you need and so much more. God is in this house. God is in this house, that's all that matters now, that's all that matters now. God is in this house, God is in this house, that's all that matters now, that's all that matters now, all that matters now. Give way to freedom, let her give way to healing, standing here on holy ground. Anything can happen now, and in the name of Jesus, all death and hell defeated, standing here on holy ground. Anything can happen now. in this house God is in this house that's all that matters now that's all that matters now God is in this house God is in this house that's all that matters now that's all that matters now. God is in this house, that's all that matters now, that's all that matters now, God is in this house, God is in this house, that's all that matters now, that's all that matters now.
those that are around you this morning. Please maybe give a little wave, certainly to those at home, and maybe they're not able to be with us, or maybe that you're watching from us from afar. We're glad that you have decided to be with us on this Sunday morning. So as you know, you can be seated if you would like to be. We appreciate all of you that have come here today. Appreciate moms and grandmas and little ladies and Actually, we're really grateful for every person from every walk of life, and if you've chosen to be here this morning with us, we're grateful. Uh, one of the things that you should know about our church is that we are very welcoming. Uh, we like people from all walks of life. You don't have to be a perfect person to come here because otherwise they would probably kick me out, right? So that's what they would end up doing. So we are grateful for the imperfections in which we have, and that means that you have a, here, a place here too. And so we're not here to look down on anybody, but if you're looking for a place to worship, to be able to grow, I do believe that Willow Creek is that place. This is the Tower Service where we do have a short time to be able to share what's on our hearts and minds. First, like we have celebrated moms this morning, but maybe there's something else that you would like to bring this morning, and I guess Vicki will get us started. So, who would have thunk? Yeah, who would have um, thought, right? <laughs> Speaking of Anna Mac Mitchell, um, Brian and Debbie Gordon, who some of you know, were in Florida for a wedding, and they had dinner with Anna Mac, and Debbie posted a picture, and I don't know whether it's an old picture or a new picture, but Anna Mac looked fantastic, and I just wanted you all to know that. And then, um, bear with me through this. There was a last call ceremony at, at, the, at the VA on Friday, and I went with Addie. Um, there was about 30 veterans that were honored. We took a picture of our veteran, and then the, the person held up the picture, and we stood up, and we got a rose. Addie got a rose. And then when they did all that, you could stand up if you wanted to and say a few words about your veteran which I did, which I cried, which I told Addie before we left home that that's what would happen, that there would be tears. And I took a little coloring book and crayons for her to play with so she would be quiet. But during that time, she, she was attentive. She, she sat up and she looked at every, you know, listened. And it's important to me that I talk about Jean so that they don't forget. And that was a special time that she saw that other people were honoring, talking about their loved one. And I was honored to be a part of that. Amen. Anyone else have something they would like to share this morning? Yes. Just thank you for coming out to the hill. <coughs> Carly's beautiful. Very good. Um, cousin helped with trimming the dress and then she came and did her hair. Just beautiful. And I'm very proud to say this woman right here is my mother because Without her, I would be the same woman and mother, and she's everything. So I'm very proud and lucky to have her. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, I'd like to um, just put a prayer out there for all the people. Maybe this is their first Mother's Day without their mother. Um, this is our first without Auntie. And um, one of our good friends at the lake uh, lost her daughter over a month ago. And this was her first. Mother's Day without her daughter, and she, she 
she is struggling, obviously. So prayers for that family um, and anyone that's going through that right now. So, and I'm proud of her at the moment. Yes, yes, yes. Richard, he's having problems with this, but continue prayers, please. We're, we're going to, um, I guess, cut it off there, not to say cut anybody off. If you do have anything else that you'd like to share, just for the sake of brevity for our service, because I know that you guys have places to go and places to be and uh, things like that. But we're going to pray over all this this morning and give it to the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we pray for mothers of all various different kinds. Uh, for many, this, is, this can be a, a day of rejoicing, but for many we know it can be a very hard day. And I spoke to a person this morning, and I told them that I was praying and thinking about them because even though it's Mother's Day, uh, this is you know, the first time that they would be without their husband. And uh, during a time where they're together, we, we pray for women for all walks of life, for the ones that are new, maybe new in marriage. We pray for those that maybe they're trying to conceive and they can't. Um, some women love to be here on this day, and, and some people try to avoid it, and we understand that. Uh, it can be a, a mixture of emotions, especially if we have lost someone who we loved, especially if that is a child. And so we pray over those hearts. We Pray and thank you for the good things. Uh, I pray that we would just continue to remember those that aren't here, but they're, they're not forgotten. They're not far from our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we just pray over everything with this service, and we just pray that you would receive all the glory and our praise. Pray that you continue to build us, meet those prayer requests that we weren't able to say this morning, but thank you, Lord that you know them and you know all the details with them without us saying that doesn't mean we don't pray it's just that father you know our hearts when sometimes we just simply can't get things out and so we just pray over our church we pray that you would please bless us i do pray that you would continue to infuse your spirit into us help us to grow and to be a light into this community and lord that you would just be the centerpiece of everything which we do during this service today and in jesus name we pray amen would you stand as we sing together the doxology? Praise, Praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy seated. Our scripture today comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and I don't have the page number, I'm sorry, for your pew Bible. 157, 157 in your pew Bibles. Thank you, Diane. O oh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them intentionally to your children and shall talk, talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Right. Today's message, as you can see from our, our bulletin, is Be Encouraged, a picture of faithful motherhood. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. I was thinking as I was coming here that if my mom were here, uh, with me today. I mean, she's here, she's in the community. I'm very blessed in that, but I would probably change this to be a little bit of be encouraged, moms. Uh, you're doing a very good and faithful work. So 
I'd only add that little part to it because of the reminder of the good work in which so many moms do. And as you know, that we are celebrating Mother's Day. If you didn't catch that already today, it's a very wonderful and special day that we celebrate mothers. And not only grandmothers, but grandmothers, probably aunts and uncles. I mean, it really it is a celebration in many ways of the whole family in many ways. But again, this is a day that we set aside for those that have cared for us in many ways. Uh, one of my favorite cards that I gave to my own mother several years ago that, that basically was a card that said, thank you, Mom, for all the things that you do. Otherwise, I would have suffocated a long time ago underneath a big pile of tube socks. <laughs> and so that was right because I'm not sure if she was saving me just because of the pile of them or the toxic waste fumes that come off of them. So I'm not sure what that was, but that was always my favorite one that I gave to my mom. But in all seriousness, Mother's Day is something that we celebrate is, uh, as a holiday is actually hasn't been around for very long. I don't know if you know that. As far as a national holiday and the things of the sorts that it was really conceived in the heart of a woman named Anna Jarvis in 1908. Uh, she did so with the intent that she would sought to honor mothers for their sacrifices, for their love, and everything else, especially in light of the fact that her own mother had just passed away. And it became, of course, a holiday that we celebrate as a nation since 1914. I don't know if you know that. So other interesting facts concerning Mother's Day, and I looked these up, that the first official Mother's Day, again, not nationwide, but one that was celebrated was at Grafton, West Virginia in 1908 at a Methodist church that was located there. And I thought that was really interesting. We can also think that more phone calls are made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. And I'm sure that you can understand why. To tell mom that I love you and I appreciate you and all those other things. But it's actually amazing how much it spikes. That many record that it's up 37% in the average day on Mother's Day. That's a lot. I don't know how many calls are made by you on the average day, but if we're probably looking at it, there's probably tens of millions of calls that are being made every single day so that there's more than a third more of those, some others say, that should tell you a lot about what's happening, of course, with phone calls. And of course, one, that third, the last fact that you should know that Mother's Day is probably the third most well-attended Sunday of the year, only behind Christmas and Easter. Don't know if you knew that. So, you know, if you came here today and your mother dragged you here, I mean, brought you here today, you are in good company because your mom or grandma or a significant person in your life wanted you to be here on this day, and it's really great that you're here. As we you know, I have a very special place in all of our hearts, and we have to admit that in many ways that not all of us did have great moms. We do have to admit that some of us maybe desire to be moms, and we simply can't be, and that makes the day intrinsically hard on many. But overall, I would say that at least in the heart of God, that it was his general good to all to make mothers, to basically make the family. We think back to the Old Testament when God made everything and in the beginning that God was the one who made families. He is the one that has made families as kind of a cornerstone to be a blessing to the community and actually the rest of the world. The very first command that God actually gave to Adam and Eve collectively together is be fruitful and multiply. And we can, of course, reduce that to some just basic things that could happen within a marriage, but really he wanted their, their good and families and things to multiply, to be across the whole earth, that the whole earth would be filled with his glory, and part of that glory was families, which include, of course, fathers and mothers, and even in the sense that even in broken families, there's still some intrinsic good that is there, or even a lot of intrinsic good that is there. And so it was always in the heart of God to provide blessings through that, even though that through a broken world, that sometimes that doesn't always play out. 
But, of course, mothers being what they are and what they do, and even father as well, that almost nobody actually talks about how notoriously difficult it is to play that role. I mean, maybe you hear about it, just kind of little bits and pieces that are here and there, but honestly, parenting as a whole is, is probably one of the most greatest but most difficult callings that God can actually give to us, especially in a fallen world. We, we don't talk about that much. Few couples talk about the burdens, even just even sometimes of conceiving children or bringing them to term, and that is the the fact of rearing them and raising them. And honestly, they never grow up to be a place where you don't love them and kind of be motherly or fatherly over them. I mean, even when they're fifty, I always tell my kids, "You're still gonna be my babies. I'm I'm still gonna be one who's gonna watch over you." Uh, you never get to that, and they're always kind of like a burden in which you carry on your heart. And being a parent is a lot like running a marathon. Um, you get to run, whether you like it or not. You're always kind of running. You don't have time often to take bathroom breaks. You don't have time to eat, sleep, much of anything else. You're always heading towards rearing these children the way which you're supposed to do. And it's a great work. It's just Let's be honest, it is, it is very tiring. So if you've come here today and you feel tired, guess what? You're also in very good company amongst everybody who's here. It's hard work, but it's also sometimes in many ways a very debilitating work. It, it's an overwhelming work. And so even as a pastor who has counseled many people in the past, uh, one of the things that I find that when I am, of course, counseling with women, but especially mothers is, is that for many of them, there is, there's a lot of weight for the fact that they have mothered. There is, uh, for some at least, that there's a lot of doubt. Uh, there is sometimes even a shame that comes in sometimes questions or even just statements that they make while meeting with me. Sometimes I'll hear things like, nothing prepared me to be a good mother. Maybe they didn't have a good example, or just maybe everything was simply overwhelming, that they just say, nothing could prepare me for this and the demands that it would be. Others would say, was I too harsh when I was raising my kids? Or was I too lenient? Should I have maybe done more? Or even just the basic question of, did I give them everything in which they need to be a good and upright person, do I give them everything they need to, to basically have a successful life? And it's very easy to nitpick oneself, to look back and this wonder of the things in which we wish we would have done or that we could have done or which we had known better about. It is a very hard thing. And I find that at least for many that just simply the fact of raising kids being so difficult, and then when kids go off, that a lot of times their success or their struggles in life feel like they're a, they kind of a reflection upon us. We look in the mirror and just say, well, their success, right or wrong, their success is maybe based upon me. I mean, this is, this is a mountainous amount of burdens. This is something that just weighs in the mind and the conscious. And so if you're a person who's ever lost sleep over your children, yes, again, you're in you're in very good company. But what really does make a good parent? And I, I think this is an important question to ask. It's very general, I get that. But uh, anyway, that you'd have an idea of how do you know that you have parented well? Or to put it more specifically to mothers, how do you know that you have mothered well? Or you have grandmothered well? Or you have done so faithfully with the little ones that are in your life? Maybe you don't even have children, but maybe you have Maybe children in Sunday school rooms or you have children in other avenues that they're yours. You have ownership over them, that you love them and you care for them. But how do you know that you've been faithful? How do you know you've been successful? And I think that is a good question to answer. And I think that what God actually says, concerned about what faithfulness is, is both eye-opening but also very liberating in what it says. We return back to our passage and what God is saying here, and that he is telling, God is telling his people in Deuteronomy 6, 
that this is a picture of faithfulness that he expects of God's people. To give you a very brief kind of summary of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is basically a series of sermons that Moses gives to the people of God before they enter the promised land, all these things that are given to them by God. Really, they're almost like a recapping of the Ten Commandments. But here we have, just in this short passage, that one of the central pieces, actually, of the Christian faith. This is often called the Shema. It is a type of prayer. It is this acknowledgement that there is only one God, he, yes, he does exist in three persons. We know that from the New Testament. But here it is that the Lord, the God, that he is one and that he is everything. And then we are actually told what that actually looks like. That if he is the Lord God, then that he is one that as God's people, it says in verse 5 that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. I mean, just the totality of your person is going to love God. This is what a faithful Christian looks like. Just say, even if we want to put it in different terms, a successful Christian is going to be the one that first loves God and second is diligent to fulfill the things which God has called them to do. And so that's very basic and very difficult, but at the same time, there's goodness in this. And so he tells them right before they go into the land that this is a priority for you, but this is not supposed to be lip service. This is not supposed to be something that you talk about, but this love for God and making him number one in everything shall be in every facet of your life. It is going to be the way in which you live. It's going to be the way in which you talk. This is going to be the way in which you act. And in fact, it's going to be number one in everything you do, even in the rearing of your own children. That God should be number one in everything, even in your heart, as you exemplify it to little hearts. This is what you're supposed to be. And we can summarize that by saying that in verse 8 that he says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And verse 7 says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And then he goes on and talks about the way which you could do it is as you're going along, as you're sitting, as you're going. I mean, it's kind of this, this picture of this like it's not just some point. Uh, you're like, well, we're going to have this one hour, a, a, you know, a day or a week that we're going to do it. It's just like, notice their conversation. Now, they don't have these be these big Bible studies, devotions or everything, but it might be that we're pointing all of our heart and our love and our good to the Lord. And he says that you need to do that regularly. Now, what that regularly looks like, he doesn't really say, but regular enough that it's a part of their life. You're to instill your love of God into their lives. Now, again, they're partly responsible for receiving that. But at the same time, to be a good parent, to be a faithful parent, at least in the Lord's eyes, you give the children the Lord. That's above everything else. It, it just simply is. Now, why do I, I say this, or why do I come to it this kinds of ways? Because if you've been a parent or you've been a mother for any length of time, you know the different voices in which you hear about what a good parent actually looks like. I mean, we, you just have jabber and hear. I mean, you have everything from blogs. You have YouTube videos. You have books. You have conferences. You have everything else. And in some ways, it's good in that way. We have no lack of information but at the same time that sometimes that's overwhelming and some of those messages don't actually coincide with each other. They almost seem like as if they have different voices. I was just looking very casually and I decided, hey, let, let's do a very short experiment. I went to Amazon, I got on there and I punched into the search bar, a very dangerous phrase, parenting book. Okay? Can you imagine what came up with that? There were so many results, it couldn't, it couldn't even list them all. All it said was 50,000 plus. 
Okay, so it, it was somewhere beyond 50,000. It'll be 60,000, 70,000. I really don't know. But all of them were just saying, and I'm like, oh my gosh. If you are a parent looking and say, how should I parent? You're looking at all these resources. You're going to have more than you could ever read in probably 50 lifetimes. And I decided, like, well, let's take an inventory of these. Now, I'm not, you know, just repeating particular ones. I just took some of the, the first search results, and I want to share those with you about what these parenting books sounded like. The first one said, connection before correction, a, a parenting strategies for connecting with your children. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, parenting super kids with ADHD. Uh, the whole brain child. Next is raising good humans. How to talk to your kids so that they will listen. The book you wish your parents had read right, as, as they sought to raise you. And maybe the one that was probably the most eye-opening was how to stop losing your blank, and I'm, it's not blank, how to stop losing your blank with your kids. I thought maybe at least that was the most transparent of all of those, right? I mean, just like, how do you not lose your mind with your kids? And I was reading these, and, and part of me was just feeling, man, I'm just kind of grateful because there's this endless source of resources and all these sorts of things that I thought, oh, this is good. I don't have to do all those things on my own. But then at the same time, I felt bad. I, I, I felt overwhelmed, like, if I'm going to be a good parent, shouldn't I do at least a good portion of these? I mean, in some of it, it's just like, I don't know, it makes me feel strange inside even just to read them. The book you wish your parents had read? I mean, to me, that seems to imply that they didn't do so good with you. If they would have read our book, they would have done a whole lot better. Right? And maybe you can do a little bit better. And it almost seems to apply even further is if you don't read this book, you don't take these things in, you're just going to be like your parents who didn't do so good. Maybe I'm reading into that just a little bit. But that's how I feel when I read it. I say, again, all these things that seem to suggest that if you want to be a good parent, you're going to do this stuff. If you don't, you're being negligent. If you're not doing this and this, and maybe being the mom who is everywhere present, who's taking their kids to here and there, to everywhere, to giving them baseball, to giving them choir practices, to doing this. If you don't give your children everything, you're not being a good parent. I think the deep down inside, we still, in many ways, think that being a successful parent is giving our kids the American dream, right? We, we want our kids to do better than ourselves. Well, that's not wrong. But we think that ultimate su success for us to be faithful is to make sure that when they get out that they can be, you know, maybe a doctor or maybe they can have that two-story house and, you know, 2.5 kids, the white picket fence, and, you know, two cars and three garage doors because you need that other one for all your junk. Right? And this is what we think is the picture of faithfulness, is getting them to be the place where they're successful financially. Because maybe deep down inside, we think that's most important. Maybe deep down inside, we think that being successful in the sense of being prestigious is what they really need to be happy and successful. But this is actually... Not only wrong, but I think at the end of the day, we know that it's wrong. I mean, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying neglect preparing your kids for the next step of life. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not pushing away life skills. I mean, those things are all, all awesome. They're all great. But the highest priority, the greatest good that we can give to our children is a love of Jesus in their hearts. And the reason being is that the two problems with believing that a successful mother is going to give them the American dream and everything else and do it this kind of way is it's very narrow in scope 
Because let's be honest, we're putting a lot of emphasis on the next 10 or 20 years of your life. And I know that feels long when you're in the middle of it. I get that. I mean, we've all felt that. We're like, man, 10, 20 years, it seems like it's forever in the future. But when you're in the middle of it and you're going through it, you realize this isn't that long of their lives, really. And it's even narrower still because in the wider picture of things, if God says he is all that we really need, isn't he all that we really need is to cling close to him and he will take care of us? I mean, that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. He said, do not worry. Why? Because the Gentiles worry. Where about what am I going to eat? What am I, I going to drink? What am I going to do here? Like, what am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do? All these things because they live with a godless kind of existence where God isn't part of the equation, but he said, you're not like that. You don't have to worry because you have a heavenly father who's going to take care of you to provide for you, and even though that you may not know all the details or the how, how, the why, or the directory and everything else, and again, it's not some sort of escape of, of just being lazy, but I'm saying that God is going to ensure that his own are cared for. He's going to bring them to the next step, to the next month, because I can assure you, anybody who's ever been an adult any length of time, there's a lot of things where we just don't know the next step. But God does. And if we're, close, we're holding close to him, that's what we need the most. I actually thought about it in different terms. It's one of the few times you actually see me with a visual illustration. So, so, you know, you should be grateful for this this morning. But to think about it in a different kind of term is we should think of, of our lives that we get to spend with our kids almost like this little piece of rope. You're, you're, you're as a parent trying to invest in this, like, maybe the next 10 or 20 years of their life. And yeah, that's important. That's good. I mean, getting maybe to the right school, the right calling, all that stuff. But in view of everything, this is not really that long a time. You know, add a little bit more. I mean, and say this is, this is their calling. Maybe they get married. They get everything else in their lives. And maybe the whole of their life just looks like this. But if we want to put it in perspective of all things, we can think of their lifetime is only like this, but maybe the whole life of the whole earth is only like this. And that's it. I mean, C.S. Lewis said, take a pencil and draw a line segment on a white page, and that is all the time of all the cosmos put together in view of eternity we're preparing our kids not just for this we want to prepare them for eternity and what does that look like it looks like this it looks like this it looks like this you got some more rope here Let's keep going you got some more rope coming out you got some I mean, this is time. This is all time. It represents time. It just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And, and we can see that when you hold it out and you whip it out, you start seeing that's time. But that's not even all of time. That's not even eternity. If you were to take this whole room and fill this with rope that represents time, you fill it to the ceilings and you had tens and thousands of buildings like this that's not even beginning to get close to what eternity is like. Don't focus yourself and your kids just on this. This is good. But eternity of Christ, look at how much better it is. You're preparing them for life and eternity eternity and joy and everything else. Jesus shouldn't take the backseat to anything. Why? Because belief in him is forever and ever. And I can tell you, we can't even begin to imagine how long eternity is going to be. And when we look back at our lives, if we trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we look back, all I can say is our lives 
here on earth will nothing but be a shadow. It'll be a passing memory. But life with Jesus is everything. As God said to his people, Yes, O Israel, hear and know the Lord your God is one. Teach this to your children. Teach it. You don't have to be perfect. Were you a person and maybe read your Bible to your child? Maybe sing them one of the best theological songs of all time. Jesus loves me, this I know, for my Bible tells me so. That's a good theological song, by the way. It's great. It's true. He does love us. And if you, even if you've done that, and you say, well, I, I didn't do all this. I didn't, I'm not you, Pastor. I didn't do all this stuff. You don't need to be like me. I hope you're not. I hope you're you. Um, but if you're giving them Jesus, that's what they really need. And I would say that on the flip side of things, that if you're a kid, or maybe you're growing up now, and you had somebody who maybe would pray over you, take you to church, even if it wasn't consistent. If they read the Bible to you, they pointed you towards Jesus, maybe you're more blessed than you even realize that you are. And if you have the opportunity, thank them for that. Thank you, Mom and Dad. And I'm actually saying this as an escape so I don't have to say it later to my parents. I'm joking. Uh, I say to my mom, thanks, Mom, for taking me to church. Thanks, Dad, for taking me to church. Thank you that, yeah, you didn't have all the answers. You didn't know all the stuff. You don't have to. You bring them to the Lord. He's going to take care of them. He's going to draw them and keep them and take care of them. And why that is so important is because this is a truth and a joy that we'll have for all of eternity. All the opinions of men and all the books and all the stuff, guess what? It's all gonna pass away. It's all gonna be forgotten. And maybe we won't get by with the opinions of men in this world, but I will tell you, the beliefs and understanding of God are the only thing that matter at the end of the day. Because it's his beliefs and truth that's gonna carry on for eternity. And I don't know about you, but it's very comforting to me. It really is. I mean, I know I'm not a mom here, but I'm just saying as a parent, it's very comforting to me that I give them Jesus. And I can look in the mirror and say, you did a great job. If you've given them Jesus as a mother, grandmother, whatever, you have done a faithful work. Be glad. Be encouraged because... God was able to use you in a very powerful way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we thank you this morning, we thank you that even as God's people were entering into the promised land, that he reminded them to keep him first. This is not really anything new. This is something that Jesus taught, that the two of the greatest commandments, of course, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And these two go hand to hand and they go together. But again, that you, Lord, should always be first. And yes, there's important things in this world, important things to study. We're not saying just ignore all that and just say kick back and just forget all of life. But always keep in view that eternity with Jesus is what we need more than anything else. This life in many ways works its way out. You lead us in the paths in which we go. You, you are sovereign over all things. You will get us to the place in which we need to be. And that is true not only for us as Christians, but even for all of those that are across the world, that your plans will take place, that you will go forward, and none of that will be stopped, Lord. That our idea is we need to trust you with all things. And Father, all the rest of it will go into place as you see fit. Father, we thank you for this. I, again, I pray that we are encouraged. I pray that we can just look in the mirror and just be glad for what you have done. We thank you, Lord, for all that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our last song.
Again, so good to worship with you this morning. Let's close in a short word of prayer. Father, where we celebrate you today and thank you for the words which you've given to us. Thank you that if we hold close to you, that you will hold close to us. I pray that if anybody doesn't know you this morning as Lord and Savior, that they know that you're not far away, that you're actually closer to them than they may realize. Pray that you'd instill in us hope and faith. I pray that you'd help us to celebrate the rest of today. And I pray that we just celebrate families and the things which we have. Celebrate that we have life and that you have given these things to us. Pray that we would go in your peace. I pray that we would go in your comfort and in your strength and come back here next Sunday at the right appointed time. And may you bless us and keep us in this week to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.